What's with the photo? Shoot the other day about Ingolos Yao. That's something I've never seen before. Look at it. Okay, right. Starts working. Yeah, it's following the signs. Yo, yo, yo. Maga figure out. Since part of the man, they've been waiting for him. Got got long little old vulalit. Back calling you lost. Not a shangi lost. You couldn't miss his rule. Yes, that's it. So, Matalam Khablis, it was never about the wings, Mfano. It, it's the fire in you. Yeah. Mandela and the ANC weren't on the same mission because when Mandela was removed from jail to start the negotiations in 1987 he was negotiating with the CIA the CIA was basically creating Mandela to be bigger than the ANC so already the news media which is controlled by the propaganda machine was already showing us that there's Mandela and then there's the rest of these other ANC savages in fact, the main one who would turn this country into turmoil is Chris. Let's kill him. And that's why Chris Honey was killed. This is The Hustler's Corner. Oh, Chief. Ukran. <laughs> you okay, missed it. And then it starts a conversation in the comments. Oh, okay. That's the whole entire thing. So, I mean, from, from that previous episode, I mean, like, I don't even know how many views is it sitting on now? I'd sit on 30,000 views in five days. Oh, the camera is on. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Hustlers Corner. We call Miss Wurache in Joburg. First up, let's go straight to the Chop Chop sign. Guys, we have to click the like button. Why? It helps the algorithms so they expose our content to as many people as possible. Number two, you have to click the subscribe button because we're growing a community here. We want you guys to be a part of this journey. We're growing this journey. We're going to 100 episodes. At some point in a couple of years' time, we'll be on 1,000 episodes. We are inspired by what everybody else is doing all over the world. The best in the game currently in South Africa is MacGyver. I'm not ashamed to say I'm inspired by MacGyver. He's one of the most amazing um, South Africans that, have, that has created a new path of hustling online, which is podcasting. A lot of us have been exposed to it, but not a lot of us took it as serious as MacGyver did when he was fired from a couple of radio stations and he decided to go he bet, start his own He bet own everything. Thing. He bet yeah. the house on it. He bet ev he, even his house, right? Every, he lost everything. So I'm saying he bet the house on it. Like, you know, he had to he, he, um, he, he had to cancel his bond. You know, he move out of the house that he was staying in, rent a small, a small Anyana apartment, you know. His mother helped him out during the Lena months. And at the same time, he has to maintain his relationship with the mother of his child as well. And you know how tough it is. Imagine hey, not bro. making money mm. and she needs money. She's working. She's the breadwinner for the longest time. You know what I mean? So luckily he had a partner that could support him during um, uh, the low times. But I think most importantly um, is that, you know, he's been able to have an impact on so many people's lives. You know, like so many people's lives just because and just because of, you know, believing in his talent, because that's it. He knew that he was a great broadcaster. He's been like everybody knew that. From, now, ro even, from even rocking when, the girls even on before, YFM. <laughs> even when before rocking the girls, I think like, I mean, I met McG when he was doing the show before your show. In the yeah, morning. in the morning. Yeah, at YFM. Yeah. You understand? And Mina, just by knowing him, I knew, OK, fine. By hanging out with him. I could automatically meet Usbuda mm. during your changeovers mm. in the mornings. Yeah, you understand what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, op other opportunities could come on. You know, um, um, even the day that I brought the Elias to come and promote his album launch to your show that morning, that whole entire morning I was with McG. Oh, you had come earlier. I, yes, I'd, I'd been there hanging out. You know what I mean? But you know, making sure. All I needed to make sure that Les arrives on time, but I was there already early. When you started preparing for the show, you and I started having conversations. I got I met um there's a guy you used to work with, Trevor. Trevor, yeah, Trevor yeah, Madonna. The, the Trevor guy, Zuma. Is it Flora or Flower Media? Flower Media, yeah. You understand? Oh, you remember? <laughs> What's uh, up, bro? Yeah, Welcome back. You understand? So like, yeah. So, you know, you told me like, no, this guy is very big on online stuff and everything else, you know. So um just this to see how far he's come with the podcasting and um and the impact that he's had and also to see the amount of people that are sleeping on the potential that yeah. podcasting has as well a lot know? of people are still sleeping on podcasting bro and i i can understand why because you know um radio and television were the formats that we knew were the only formats you knew and 
you know, from watching uh, another guy, King David. Yeah, David, David Machabella, Machabella, yeah. You know, and like, he's a guy who was like inspired by Mac G. Yeah, he was an OG, even though he had studios and everything else, he was inspired by Mac G. And what's, what really made his podcast blow up was when he interviewed Mac G on his show. I think yeah. that's even still the most viewed. But the content that he's been able to bring, he's been able to bring all the older personalities of yesteryear. Yeah. Right? And what I've learned from watching all these guys, uh, your Gran um, uh, uh who else did he bring in? Jesus has been bringing yeah. a lot of people. Your Ernest Delays. Yeah, yeah. And everything else, you know? In- initially, he started it as a radio podcast. Yeah. But it has evolved. It, it has evolved to people who've been in the media space, who've been in TV, actors, and everything else. He did, in uh, that Jeremy Fugeng, the guy who, uh, Jerry, yeah. is it Jerry Mutaung? Was that? Mufu Gang. Mufu yeah. Gang. Okay, yeah. So, you know, all these people that I've been watching, right, for me, it has brought me immense value. Like, it, by my estimation, David Mashabela has given me uh, an advanced diploma in South African media industry, especially the black media. Just by watching David Mashabela, I've got an advanced diploma. How much is an advanced diploma? Jesus, thousands. It's probably 200,000, 300,000. Okay, I, I, I should owe him 200,000. I should own that the David Mashabella for the value that I've got from watching. And all I had to pay for was the data. You guys get it, right? So as a hustler, you, you got to look at the people that give you value. A lot of us follow social media people or platforms for fun, for gossip, for things that make us laugh. There's nothing wrong about that. But if you can hustle smart on this internet thing, you can get so much value, yet you spend so little. So you understand? So best by watching him, the amount of value that I've been able to get, I now can say, okay, fine. With this advanced diploma in South African media, I now understand that the South African population from back in the day, from apartheid times, right? The media that they had was controlled by the state. You know, um, radio itself is a military platform. It was used by the military to communicate and then it became a public uh, information dissemination platform, which... Uh, was then commercialized. Right? Radio Bantu was the first one. You understand? Which turned and became Kozi FM. So Abu Prakos did not just start radio. They worked for the SAUKA. Yeah. For the SABC. Yeah. Which was the apartheid government's propaganda machine. Yeah. You understand? So as much as Uprakos was one of us, right? And he could understand our languages. The person that put him in his job was our enemy the person who was supposed to be suppressing us so uprakos's job was to entertain us enough that we can forget about the actual issues that we're facing the repression that we're facing and also at the same time you know do his own secret covert mission to conscientize us without his bosses finding out in the public you understand what i'm saying imagine like your boss is following you on facebook and now you must now uh what do you call conscientize the public the people that he is trying to brainwash and undermine and everything else right to their own power to their own beauty to everything that's good about them without the boss finding out what you're actually doing and still making it look like you're doing a good job for the boss so you know he had those two things to decide and those were the things that he needed to decide upon when he chose Ndate Tuso to be a voice on um, uh, Lisedi FM. And then when he takes Ndate Tuso to be a voice on Lisedi FM, what he understands as course is that the audience that's listening to Ndate, Ndate Tuso doesn't know who course is, doesn't know that Ndate Tuso was brought here by course, and doesn't know who course's bosses are. They think that Ndate Tuso is a guy who climbed into the radio. If they break open their radio, Ndate Tuso will have to jump out. I used to think that when I was a kid. You understand what I'm saying? So, Kurs understands this. And knowing that, right, what it does is that it creates a media, a media hegemony. So, because Ndate Tuso is now on radio, he's got a platform that no other black man that I've ever observed has had. Yeah. And that gives him a certain level of authority that no other black man that I've ever observed has had. So... Automatically, Untate Tuso becomes more influential, right? And influences power. Because at the end of the day, 
uh, your parents have got uh, an influence over you because you live under their house and therefore they've got power over you. They tell you where you go to school. They tell you what time you wake up in the morning. They tell you what time is bedtime. They've got power. So influence is power. And that too so then automatically became more influential than any than the, uh, the, 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 the king of the Basutu. Because the king of the Basutu is not on the radio talking to his subjects or his people every day, like Ndate Tuso is. He became more powerful than um, the, the, the Tswana kings, the royal Bafukeng. Because the royal Bafukeng are not on uh, radio every day talking to their subjects and talking to their people. Now, with that great influence, with that great power, Ndate Kuo's job was to teach Ndate Tuso's his responsibility. And that responsibility is something that now, by observing Untate Tuso and the man he's become, we can see, has he been a responsible leader? Has he been a responsible person of influence? Has he been a responsible person with power? And we can say that he has been, because we look at him right now, he didn't abuse his power. And he still has it. He's still influential. At his ripe old age, it wasn't just about his youth. He did it in his youth up until his old age, and now... His legacy is that his influence has reached so many people that Yena, he doesn't have to do it anymore because there are other Ndate Tusos that were inspired by him. The DJ Smooths of this world, the Tibo Touches, because the why? DJ Freshers. Because when I'm... When, 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 well, I'll, I'll we're say, a younger I'll, generation. I'll yeah. say the DJ Smooths of this world. Yeah. I won't say the same about other DJs that are in your peer group because... From what I've observed, right, from your generation, you're the only one who actually has got a desire to end up being and that they too so. Because it's not just about you. It's not just about yourself. And I know that obviously you don't get the chance to interview many people who have observed you and have admired your work, right? But the job, the role that you play, uh, 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 Prasbud, is a very important role because at no point in time have us who are looking up to you ever felt like ah usbuda ule he's out of reach we can't even get any advice from him we can't even ha- you've humbled yourself to the point where anybody can reach you but also at the same time anybody can insult you you look at the radio space and you know the media space and um, the fact that our media is much more influential and much more consolidated than american media Oshala Main will never be on a radio station where you can speak to 5 million people in the United States of America. There's no, there's no radio station that's as big as Metro FM in America. They have to do syndication. It's different shows, they've got different time zones. So people don't understand that America is like Africa as a continent. Yeah, it's, it's two where, different time zones in one. Where South Africa is like Texas, like a state within the greater continent. And South Africa has got its time zone, right? And then New York is another state. It's got its time zone, like Kenya, which is an hour uh, ahead or behind of us, right? And then California also has got its own time zone, like Nigeria or Ghana on the West Coast. And they're another hour. So if you look at it like that and you think, okay, South Africa is like Texas, it's in the middle. You know, Kenya is like on the East Coast. In, in Nigeria is on the west coast, like California. Then you look at the, the our countries, like America looks at its states. And each of its states has got its own government, as we've seen. Like the governor of Texas is Greg Abbott, you know? Uh, the guy who confused South America with South Africa and said, yeah, all these South African immigrants that are illegally jumping the border into America and thinking to myself, yo, <laughs> I love what you're saying because umlando um sagazo uti the 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 stations that mm. we have right right now would be considered as ALS stations. Mm. That would be the 16 radio stations that belong to the SABC, mm. which are broken up or demarcated according to the different tribes mm. which live in the different provinces mm. and they are serve the different tribes in their own ways and the biggest radio stations in south africa are those radio stations mm. obviously number one being being ukosi fm then you've mm. got umshobo mm. and then you've got the rest mm. 
which mm. is a beautiful thing because but then that's said, diversity, you've right? Got Tobela, then you've, you've got, got Mungana, yes, you've, you've got, got Palapala, uh, Palapala, you've got Mutswedi, Mutswedi, you've got Kwekwez, you've got Lotus FM, Lekwala Kwala, you understand? Push Radio, all those things. But now the problem is this Kwes's boss, yeah, Kwes Katebe's boss, his job is to ensure that those stations are made the way they are to divide us as Africans according to our language group so that you know, we hate each other. So that Mao Mutwana, you've got Mutweding. So and Sasha Bananga. Yeah, uh, and, and they've done that thing in, in intentionally even Nasima Lukshin. Because mm. you understand? It's Alex, the divide and conquer stra- you know what strategy. I mean? It was done intentionally. So now what happened in 1994 is that we had a democratic settlement to say that this apartheid system of separate development, it was good. Amazon must stay in Gaza. Uh, the vendors must stay in, 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 in Venda. You know, uh, 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 the, the, the pedis must stay in Skukune land. You know what I mean? As if they're not related by blood to the Botswana, who are relatives of Skukune. You understand? Mm. And the only difference between them is that Hoshi Skukune decided to migrate to one side mm. and then his people became called Pedis. Mm. So now we are separated along these lines. We don't even know how we became so separated. And we Everyone, hate each other with their combine. And now the world is also becoming more nationalistic. Because before 1990, which is when I was born, right? Now I've studied history. It wasn't the nationalism wasn't really the main thing that identified people. People were identified via their belief system. Amatruta were Jews. They were identified as Jews. When Hitler wanted to exterminate the Jews, it didn't matter which country they came from. What mattered was that they were Jewish, and therefore he could exterminate them, right? And then create a a supremacy of Christianity and his people and their belief system, right? And that is what happened. And then he gathered all the little states, which weren't countries, they didn't have a national identity, that had the same belief system as him to be his allies. And the people who are his opponents were the people who are sympathetic to the Jewish people. You know, saying, no, you can't do this to um, uh, Jewish people. Doesn't matter what your uh, greater objective is, whether you want racial purity. You must understand that Germanic people, British are Germanic people, Germans are Germanic people. They're the same people. You had Britain going to war against um, uh, Germany, and the kings are actually cousins. Before the uh, the Russian Revolution of 1917, the Russian king, the, the German king, and uh, the British king, George, all of them are cousins. They used to play with each other as kids. Now, they create this war based on, you know, a battle for resources, a battle for ideologies, you know. That's the Second World War. It divides the world and then creates a situation where a guy like Hitler can find a voice amongst the dejected people. It's like the situation that's in South Africa right now. You know what I mean? It, it, the, the grass is very dry. A Hitler can rise out of the South African situation right now. We've seen it. We saw in the July unrest that, you know, anarchy can reign uh, across our people. Um, except in the July unrest, what we also saw is that there's more people who are committed to that democratic settlement, that national identity that was created in 1994. That said, okay, this is this new South Africa where we are not separated based on our, our tribes and everything else. So that system that we had, the, the tribalistic system that separated us according to our tribes and everything else is the same tribalistic system. It's a very European culture of being that tribalist. The same tribalistic system that the Europeans had. And after the Second World War, because the First World War created the situations where um, a neo-Nazi... Uh, a supreme nationalist like Hitler could rise up and use the Jews as a reason to rally up people to um, wage war and justify this war right enthusiastically because people were really encouraged by what Hitler was uh, saying in his speeches and everything else and he was a very powerful speaker you know a very emotive speaker like a lot of our pastors and preachers you know uh, if you look at Hitler he's no difference from you know an evangelical priest um, in the way in which he speaks as an orator so beyond the Second World War, what happens is that now we're d- divided upon political ideology. To the east is the communists. To the west is the capitalists. 
And because of our political ideologies, we've got this Cold War, this bipolar world where it's either people believe in this, um, 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 uh, what you call, um, political system of communism or capital uh, or capitalism on the West. Um, and um, it's a battle. And that's what the Cold War is. And the, the countries that have got the power and the influence that are influencing everyone to either um, ascribe to communism or ascribe to capitalism, they are the two military powers. So they've got the monopoly on violence. The biggest military power on the communist side is Russia. The biggest military power on the capitalist side is the United States of America, which replaces right, the armed forces of the European nations that preceded it before um, they joined the war in 1941 after the Pearl Harbor disaster. So you must understand that Europeans' powers, right, were at war with themselves. The Germanic people were at war with themselves. The Germans on one side were at war with their other German cousins on, on the English side. And those two cousins are at war with themselves, right? And it doesn't matter what nations are in between these tribes. It's, a tr it's an internal tribal war. The other party, um, then this other Germanic party then takes over other countries like France and occupies them and everything else. And then this one, because it was part of the party um, that started the United States of America, you know, because the United States of America um, is a white Protestant British colony. That was basically its founding identity, you know. Um, they call their cousins America and say, OK, help us in this war. And for that help that they called for, it meant that, okay, fine, from now on, you guys are our military big brothers. Your military now substitutes and acts on our behalf. So the Western powers were now based on America's military might. And what America used um, that military might to do was to wage proxy wars. Now, proxy war is means like, okay, we are at war. Ne? But instead of we fight amongst each other, ne? who is under me, so I take Angola as a country and make them wage a war against, uh, against uh, a faction right, that is aligned with my enemies. So the one enemy is America. The other enemy is Russia. So what does Russia do? Russia says, Cuba, you are our friend. Please help your younger brother. Angola, mm. there's a, a civil war going on there. And then America is saying, hey, whoever wins this civil war needs to be our friend. So let's help this rebel. What's his name? Jonas Savimbi. And then they help Jonas Savimbi. And then all of a sudden, Jonas Savimbi has got weapons and everything, and then there's, there's a war. And then what does America do? They call their brother, South Africa, the apartheid government. Says, hey, Puerta, send soldiers over to Angola to assist Savimbi to bring down this um, civil war so that we can install our person to be in charge then. And that's what we've seen play out as well in South Africa. So the 1994 democratic settlement, right, comes at a point where within our minds, right, because of apartheid, as much as they divided us and everything else, we couldn't have tribalism because it didn't matter that you are Zulu and I'm Tsonga. We're both black. So the apartheid mastermind, Fervut, he miscalculated there because he tried to divide us upon something, right, which unified us. What he used to divide us, the fact that you are Zulu and I'm Tsonga, so now we must be at war. What he used made us say, but listen, that man is white and he's got his foot on both our necks. And that's because we're black. We can either fight amongst each other, right, and decide who, who must survive to have their, their neck underneath his boots. Or we can help each other and get his boot off of both of our necks. Interesting, interesting um, take. An interesting topic that you're talking about. And it brings me to the conversation that I, I was having with Peniel the other day. Mm. And I mean, I had a chat. I was watching um, Tantalax's interview as well on, on uh, podcast, uh, podcast and Chill. With yeah, with McG. Mm. Yes. It brings me to the issue of South Africans seeing their own black um, brothers and sisters as foreigners. Meanwhile, they don't see Abelungo or Chinese as foreigners. But at the same time, as much as we were broken apart, there were 
there were none of these boundaries back in the day. This is what was done to us. But be that, uh, be that as it may, we are already here now. And mm. there's rules and regulations in every and each country. Mm. And I guess what I'm trying to pick up from what Operation Dudula is doing, Nabun Tlantalax are doing, is to say, we're not saying all foreigners. We're saying illegal foreigners. Undocumented. And then undocumented. No, but he's, he's saying he's, the wrong thing. He's saying me? the wrong thing. What he I'm, should I'm, be saying is we don't want black slaves in South Africa anymore. So I'll take it back to our radio stations that are used to divide us. Now, what Ubabukos Kateba was able to do because of preserving our cultures, preserving our, our languages, we've got a great archive of oratory history of all our cultures that is recorded, that is in the SABC archives. That stuff is valuable. It's worth if they can say that the, the SABC is bankrupt, the SABC is sitting on trillions of rands. On content, yeah. Worth of content that it hasn't exploited. One other thing, I don't understand why we don't even have a, a history channel in this country to educate the masses about where, where the history of this country comes from. But we do. It's on YouTube. It just it needs you to now, because I'm DJ Spoo, I can say it in a way that makes these young kids listen. I'm influential. I can take the same history. I can take all the videos that they put up on YouTube um, from the TRC and everything else and represent them to the youth so they can get the information, they can get the history, and they can also be entertained at the same time. Yeah, but I'm saying we also need a free-to-air channel that, that, that for penetrates me, for me, that, that penetrates to the people who still me, can't afford data. In, okay, can I tell you why yeah. I, I, I say that that will be problematic. Yeah. Setting it up is unnecessary because we've got the internet now. We don't need a free-to-air channel because we're not as DJ Spoo. You can take that information. That is available. It's there. You can go to the archive. We tap it. We record a podcast and disseminate that stuff. And basically, the, 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 the centralization that would come with a free-to-air channel is now not needed anymore because you've democratized the knowledge. And now, with that knowledge, other people can say, okay, I don't need to wait for Spoo to do it. I don't need to wait for an investor to give me capital. I don't need to start a radio station. I already have the tools. I can record this audio on my phone. I can make sure that it sounds good quality, and then I can start disseminating it. And now I've created that value. And someone else is going to say, oh, damn it, I owe you 200,000 rands because you've given me an MBA mm. in my own culture that I didn't know. Mm. These people that are doing Obukobela, this Sangoma thing, and that, you don't need a radio show to do it. You can do it yourself if you're a Sangoma and you're doing the practice. Create the content, teach people. And I, I'm, I'm loving a lot of the content I'm seeing on TikTok lately. TikTok, I think it's the fastest growing platform right now. And That's I think it. in terms of its content offering, it's very diverse. You yeah. see, a lot of the other platforms are celebrity-based. Yes. What I love about TikTok, it's got a lot of ordinary people. Yes. And it's got a lot of content that is ordinary. Some of it is a makaya. It doesn't some matter whether you're a like, celebrity. It doesn't matter how many followers you've got. Actually, TikTok, You can make a video that can go viral. Yeah, and TikTok is creating its own stars. Yes. So you're getting other kids that are emerging out of TikTok mm -hmm. who are now even becoming celebrities in their own right. Yeah. But because when Upirangapa... Instagram, you never see them, right? And so, what I love is mm. now China has empowered the world. Yeah. But at the same time, you think of the bigger picture. What is China trying to do? Okay. <laughs> no, th that's fine. They've done one good thing. They've empowered the world with this tool, right? By using these same Western tools that America was using to yeah. empower the world. So they've done something that America has, has been, been doing. doing yeah. You understand? So that's cool. And again, we talk about the spheres of influence, the communist power versus the capitalist power, the imperialist power, the war manga. And guys, we're speaking all over the show. Now, there's no right or wrong. You can criticize yeah. us all you want, which is fine. That's yeah. what we want. Yeah, we, we want we, engagement. We, it's all over the show. We'll just talk about <laughs> anything. If we bore you, it's fine. You can tune out. But I like the fact that we, we, we are schooling each other. Some of the things we might not know, we might not yeah. be correct. Yeah. Uh, we're not saying what we're saying here is gospel truth. Sorry, God. Yeah, exactly. So, and we need to be sharing knowledge as well. And also, we, we shouldn't be scared of being wrong. Because if we're scared of being wrong, we'll just keep quiet the whole time. Yeah. Because if you're silent, you're, you must be right. Yeah. You can't be wrong if you're quiet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so the sphere of influence, the, the, the Chinese sphere of influence of saying, okay, fine, we'll do this, but in a better way. 
we'll remove all the politically inflammatory messages. So there's no political messages on TikTok, right? But there are other things which are not going to be important to the Chinese, but that are important to black people. There was no way where America could influence countries um, like um, Tunisia and Egypt to overthrow their governments without social media. Because social media now gave a voice to the dissenting parties within those countries. And they could now oppose the governments. They could oppose the hegemony that had power over them and repress them through its control of the media and its control of the state propaganda machine. And, and that's why Ubabukos Katebe could not put on a guy like a Steve Biko on 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 True FM. Well, I don't know what it was called in the past, but it yeah. was a, a Radio show. Bantu. Yeah, Radio. Oh, you mean the, the, the Eastern Cape? Yeah, I need to say push you. Yeah, so it was called Radio Sky. Uh, okay, so he couldn't. Put, or Radio Trans Sky. Guys, I stand to be corrected. Okay, he couldn't put um, Steve Biko on True FM, even though he was he lived right there in King Williamstown. King Williamstown, be sure it's the same place, basically. You understand what I'm saying? Imagine if you could put Steve Biko had his own talk show on radio. He couldn't. Of course, couldn't. He had to find a black guy who would not offend the actual master, but know how to code the message in such a way where you can teach that black child to love themselves and to be proud of themselves. Guys, you need to remember back in the day, the apartheid system was so harsh that you could never even say the word Mandela, the name Mandela. Mm. We didn't even know how it looked like. I remember as a kid, they never used to show his face. Mm. When they started showing his face with that um, lens, that haircut mm. like this, uh, as a boxer, That's what they, they, would cover, like. they would cover his eyes also. Mm. We never used to see him. We're not allowed to. Things like um, going to the toilet or public toilets in the mall or in town. What about Miriam Makeba's music being banned? You know what I mean? Just and like people are saying, hey, but hey, don't, don't, don't confuse people and teach them wrong history and tell them that no, Mandela... Mandela created a national identity, the Rainbow Nation. It needed a founding father. He's the founding father of the South Africa that we live in today. I think no. he was also a representative together with his comrades. He was, he, he was, he was the face, just no. like how people, when they think Mofai, they think me. But they forget there's a whole team of people behind me that makes the same no, success. No, that, that I understand. It's the no, same thing. No, no, that, that I understand. As a political movement. Th that that I understand. Yeah. That is was the ANC mission. Yeah. No, that wasn't. And Mandela and the ANC weren't on the same mission. Because when Mandela was removed from jail to start the negotiations in 1987, he was negotiating with the CIA. The same CIA that called him a terrorist until 2003, 2002, where he was removed of the terrorist list. So he was negotiating with the CIA. The CIA was basically creating Mandela to be bigger than the ANC. And that's why we see Mandela's image bigger than the ANC. I'll tell you why I know that. 1994 elections, I fought with my dad because he told me he voted for the ANC. I was four years old. I said, Daddy, why didn't you vote for Mandela? So already, the news media, which is controlled by the propaganda machine, was already showing us that there's Mandela, and then there's the rest of these other ANC savages who would turn this country into turmoil. In fact, the, the main one who would turn this country into turmoil is Chris. Let's kill him. And that's why Chris Honey was killed. So anyone else who thinks that they can... Be like Chris Hani and be a hero. Just know we'll kill you like a dog. Your comrades will be w w mopping your floor. Just like we saw Chris Hani's body lying down there in Dawn Park. Which other political hero have we seen a picture of them lying there bloody? Hmm? When uh, Dimitri Tsafendas stabbed Fervut in parliament, we don't have any pictures of that. We never saw the apartheid government taking uh, a loss being hit right at the center of their power their own president was killed in parliament where they enact the law where they create the laws that uh, are repressing people we don't even know what Dumitri's offenders looks like a lot of our old musicians were very very conscious and when they were traveling the world they weren't just traveling to go gig 
they were actually communicating the message of what was going on in South Africa. They also, just like what he said on the previous um, podcast, Unota, they played a role in liberating us because they, mo- they played, a- they contributed in mobilizing the world. They had a voice when no one else in South Africa had a voice. They were the black people because they were in America, and because of the civil rights movement and the the um, you know um, the civil rights movement. There was the the Civil Rights Act that was signed by John F. Kennedy. You know when he took a picture with um, uh, um, Martin Luther King. That was a significant victory for all black people all over the world. And because they got that civil rights victory, that inspired our own anti-apartheid movement locally. And our own artists, right, helped inspire um, the Americans to know that their struggle was not just a struggle for themselves. It was a struggle for all black people. Because that civil rights movement coincides with Africa becoming free with African states claiming their independence all over. African countries everywhere were claiming their independence. You know what I mean? The only country that wasn't colonized in Africa was um, Ethiopia. Ethiopia and, and, that's, and, and um, is it, li- no, not Liberia, Libya. No, it, well, yeah. Like yeah, 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 Libya. But, yeah. well, look. The, the, the Ethiopians fought a war against the Italians when they're trying to colonize them, and they won that war. Well, that okay. man who's highly regarded, uh, Haley, revered in, in, in Ethiopia, highly Haley Selassie. Selassie. Yeah. Okay, so l- let me put it to you like this for people who haven't studied the history. There was a big war, especially in the Eritrean parts, right, between the, uh, the Italians and the Ethiopians. The problem is that the Italians, they just ran out of money. Their military was weak, you know, out of all the European masses. They, weren't as, they didn't have a powerful um army like um uh the the iberians the portugals and the spains and the british you know what i mean they didn't have that that navy fleet so what happened is that they tried to colonize ethiopia but they didn't have the power to right and what what they then tried to do was then install a puppet leadership so what they did is that they fought they found people who were fighting against the the emperor of Ethiopia, right? And then they gave them arms, guns, gunpowder arms. Which is what they do in every country. And what they didn't know is that these people that they were giving arms were going to betray them. They're gonna take these arms, use them to overthrow the government. Once they've installed themselves as government, they're gonna use those same arms to kick out the Italians. And that's what Haley Selassie did. He was assisted by the Italians and then he turned on them. He used their assistance and used their resources to gain power, and then he turned on them. And then, when he needed to consolidate his power, there was another warlord um, that he needed to meet with, right, in um, in Ethiopia. And he called him over, and then that warlord said, "Okay, fine. I need um, for me to come to this banquet. I need six hundred of my bodyguards to attend with me, right." So the Ethiopian leader said, and I also need um, to also bring my army with me. So he brought 10,000 soldiers. So he comes to the banquet. They're having a feast and everything else. While they're busy there, he's got his 600 bodyguards. Haley Selassie sends his, um, what you call, um, his people to go to that army of 10,000 that that guy left behind. Right? They go to that army of 10,000. They start bribing the generals. Go back to your land go back home go back home it's fine this is more money than you'll ever need go back home and then the generals start taking their troops by the time the banquet is over this guy who brought his 600 bodyguards he comes out he thinks he's got his army waiting for him outside his army is gone and then Haley Selassie then made him have to sign a settlement decree which made now Haley Selassie the supreme leader of Ethiopia and that's how he was able to consolidate his power so our enemies the apartheid enemies thought that by keeping us divided the whole entire time, they'll be able to create a tribal um, competition amongst us that even if they give us back power, we will never be able to consolidate it because we'll be enemies of each other, amongst each other. They're, they had a very serious miscalculation and very big mistake that they made. Is that in South Africa, we don't have one tribal group that dominates the rest. Yes, Zulus have got numbers, but not overwhelming numbers. And therefore, they can't have 
you know, power over everybody else. It needs to be a negotiated settlement where we are all working together as a coalition. And as black powers in South Africa, our powers were coalesced according to our different tribal groups because we we're separated by apartheid. So yes, fine, they made Ukwoska um, Teba separate us with whatever um, um, radio stations that they decided that they're going to have, right? But that helped us keep our cultural identities and our histories, right? The thing is that what limited the damage that they were trying to do with that was the mere fact that um, our, our what you call, our cultural diversity. And that's why they say unity in diversity. That's our country's motto. That's the identity of South Africa. South Africa is unity in diversity. What that means is that umzulu, nomkosa, nomtsonga, nompedi, nomsutu, nomdebele, bonke bapete. Together. We are united in our diversity. And that's the South Africa that we have today, you know. And um, the problem is that now teaching people about this and teaching people to be proud in their own identity and at the same time not look at other black people as enemies takes giving everybody equal opportunity. Yeah, that's the point I was trying to drive to earlier. Uti, because we grew up under these different tribes, it's not even easy for us to see an African or an Ethiopian or a Nigerian, Libyan or a egyptian or a zambian tanzanian mm. brother and sister as a brother or a sister mm. because subconsciously even nati or, or, what, or, what, or it's the same people same nation yeah so then it's easier for us it's easier for us also let me say it's easier for the lines to be blurred mm. and and um and 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 see abanyabantu as aksabantu bagiti but that with that being said also what would cause that is the ones that are illegal that come into countries to even end up messing up and disrespect the laws of the country. But who sends and, them? And, and cause the crime. But who sends them? No, it's 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 them who leave their countries. No, 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 it's, it's, it's not. It's willingly. Yeah, no. A lot of them are willing. No. Some Let of them are, 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 are running away from wars in their countries. What is Some will? of them are seeking for better, what better, is will? better, what, better, what is will? better opportunities. What is will? Intent. Wena, okay, let me tell you. <laughs> let me tell you the difference. Ne? Wena, what school in Tembisa were you willing to go to? Well, I didn't choose at the time. Bang, bang, ketela, but okay, but even, even so, let's say yeah. you could choose anyone. No, 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 no let's say, let's say, okay. Now, is that the best school in South Africa? No. Okay. So, can you now see that even if you were willing to go to that school, you weren't actually willing? Because your options weren't unlimited. Your opportunities weren't unlimited. You had a, a, a select few choices those people that are fleeing their country have are fleeing their country because they've got no choice others not all of them no all of them no others i don't I, agree with okay you. i'll tell you how I, I i can explain it okay. right in a way in which it, it to someone else it can look like they're leaving because of choice no they're leaving because of necessity what necessitates them leaving was the fact that when the colonizer came and colonized our lands and used them for farming, right? The first col the, the colonizer was the British, Prince William's uh, uh, great grandfather. You, you mean the colonizer of? The colonizer of South Africa. Okay. Rhodes. You're right? Rhodes, Rhodesia, Yongin. When the colonizer, because there was the, the settler, the Africana, he farmed his own land. You understand? He came here, he brought people, he brought the skills, and then he farmed his own land in the Western Cape. Right? And then where he got help with farming the land, he paid for that help. The colonizer had slaves from India. So he found the land in KZN, which was brilliant for growing sugarcane. And you must remember that the colonizer has just made, has just watched Haiti become the most valuable colony and the richest nation in the world because of the sugarcane that was grown there and exported. And that was all powering the French economy. 
which was a rival of the British economy. They even had wars during the time, the Seven Years Wars, the uh, Hundred Years War, you name it. You know, they were fighting the Germanics of Britain, right? So when the, when the colonizer came with his slaves, he brought his slaves, but then slavery stopped. And he had no source of slaves to work these sugarcane fields anymore. So now he needed this powerful Zulu nation to give up its soldiers, its men, to come and work on these fields. What system could he create that would make these guys abandon their lands and come and work on the sugarcane farms? Or come and work uh, 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 in the sugarcane fields? He needs to create something else that is, he needs to create an economy that is not just based on the sugarcane because the sugarcane money is not enough money to actually create that system. He needs to create a system that would make that man's land worthless or relatively worthless. And how does your land become relatively worthless? Well, when what is underneath that land is worth more than what is on top of it. What does that mean? It means that diamonds, gold is worth more than sugar cane. It's worth more than wheat. It's worth more than all these things that you eat. You can't eat diamonds. <laughs> you can't eat uh, a gold. You can't eat platinum. You need food to survive. You need maize. You need all these things that are grown on top of the ground. So the way in which he could get us to abandon our ground was to make what is on top of our ground, which is our food, worth less than what is underneath that ground. And that industry is the reason that, that it uh, um, came about. Is that the industry was then created and then, oh, we can pay for labor. We can make a man abandon his fields and everything else and come and work here. Because he's getting more than what he would get from farming his own fields. Do you understand how now what is on top of my ground is worth less than what is below the ground? Because what is below the ground is the gold the that's in Joburg, yeah. in Vit Vatasrat, right? Yeah. Where, where is my value? It's my lands in KwaZulu-Natal. What's going to make me abandon my lands here in KwaZulu-Natal where I'm able to grow everything I need and then go to Joburg and get enough that I can supply everything that I needed for my family back home on those lands? You understand what I'm saying? So that's the system that they created. And that system got labor from everywhere in the region because there were no national boundaries then. So our entire economy was built off of getting people to cross the border. The guy who became the president of Malawi, Banda, he walked to South Africa. There was no border to stop him from walking to South Africa. He walked to South Africa, got an education in South Africa, then went to the United Kingdom, became a doctor that side, and then came back to become the president of Malawi or the dictator of Malawi, Banda. So this has been happening. The migrant labor has been happening. Brahu sings about it in Stimela. You know, that is what Shosholoza is a migrant labor song. Isfanagalo, the actual language itself. So our people were made to abandon the land and what was on top of the land, which was more valuable to us for something that was more valuable to the colonizer. And the colonizer took the difference that he's making and gave us a payment which was enough for us to abandon what our value was. Not knowing that by abandoning that value, right, on land, the thing about land is that land is only valuable if you work it. If you don't work that land, it will become a desert and then nothing grows on it. Now, a desert can either be a benefit or it can also be a, 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 a you know, it can also be um, the result of negligence. The Sahara Desert has benefited Africa because it has kept us far enough away from the guys with bigger guns, with bigger war machines than us so that we wouldn't get colonized and dominated. People ask themselves, but how come South Africa wasn't colonized and as early as all these other nations? You know what I mean? It's because we had the Sahara Desert that defended us. If you wanted to get to us, you need to cross that entire desert, the biggest desert. And you, you're, you'll most likely die before you can get to us. And by the time you get to us, 
your armies, your weapons will be meaningless. You'll be depleted. Do you think our current youth is conscientized? Because I kind of feel as much as there's history lessons in high schools, I don't think we conscientize our youth enough. Because I kind of feel even some of us who are older, who are educated, I think we're educated with that Western mindset or Western mentality without, be, with, without having to be unapologetically and proudly conscious mm. of um, where black people come from and, but, and just having that African but why would you be conscious African when be lying on the floor like Chris Hunt African black conscious mindset it's it's essential it's why important. why would you be conscious you are saying all these things but look at what they did to Steve Biko but uh, but the young people have to know this knowledge. How do you, how do you do, want to end up like Steve Biko? How did when? you know this knowledge? I Mina, mean, I learned this knowledge I got this knowledge because I'm not afraid of dying so you went and seek for it yourself that's, I had to, because I had to say that the reason why people are not seeking this knowledge is because they're afraid to die. Am I afraid to die? No, I'm not afraid to die. What I'm afraid is living a life with no purpose. So my fear of living a life with no purpose makes my death irrelevant because if I die while fulfilling a purpose, I've lived a full life. What are some of the books that you've read? Yeah. I mean, I listen to a lot of audiobooks now because reading takes a lot more time. Well, let me say, what are some of the books that you can recommend to some of our young um, listeners out, out, out there? I wouldn't recommend any books. Yeah. Because I know our young ones don't read. What I recommend... No, but they'd go listen to the audiobooks. Yeah, okay. But I wouldn't recommend books. I'd say... But they're go, books, but they're on audio format. Yeah, yeah. I would. That, that, that's my thing. That I'd recommend audio content. Um, I think what... What people need to read, Wretched Earth, Franz Fanon. The Wretched Earth, Franz Fanon. Okay, let me throw in another one there. George G. James, The Stolen Legacy. Go check that one out. W.E.B. Du Bois. Yeah. You understand? He was, a, he, was, he, was a, he was a great scholar. And I Write What I Like by Steve Biko. Definitely. That's the first book you guys should go and check out. And I also would like to recommend... Advocate Murai Tobi. Yeah. The land is ours. The land is ours. And then I'd also recommend uh not it's not Stellen Bosch Mafia. What is that? Fortena. Which is it's it's similar, I think, to um Stellen Bosch Mafia, but it, it it basically talks about the Afrikaans oligarchy. Mm. Another very good book that I just recently read. I'm not finished with it. And I, I just had the pleasure of interviewing the author. Um Season Pofu Walsh is the new upper oh. date. I, wow. I I read the book before the interview that you did with him. Yeah. Um, I watched the interview that you did with him, and I'm thinking to myself, we need more people to read that book because sure. Usizwe can't do the work that that book needs him to do because Yena, he can do the academic work yeah, he of can writing his, his and part. researching. Yeah. And I, and Re I think he's done his part very well. He has done it, but now me as Nota, I must now read Season Pofu Walsh's book. And say, okay, Mana, Susan Bofu Walsh's parents paid for a PhD at Oxford so that I can get this knowledge for free. Yeah, for free. That's what I was saying to him. I was <laughs> like, dude, you're empowering us. You are simplifying South African politics. Very to, simple. To you, are showing us, you are showing guy. us that apartheid still exists. So basically, what Mandela was able to achieve is create an idea of what South Africa could be. Our job, our purpose as a youth is to either our job as a youth is to find our purpose and either fulfill it or betray it what is your purpose hmm you know i think my purpose is to to be a beacon beacon of hope and inspiration yeah to lead the way to shine the light to show people that okay it's possible we can get to this um 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 like i've always had a motto and it's a motto that um we had when we did our first tour namachita in 2012 it's called only those who risk going too far can find out how far one can go so if everyone asks hey does nota go too far sometimes yes because i'm trying to find out how far one can go in every single direction and sometimes people go, hey, are you going too far? No, I, I'm still alive. Right? So as long as I'm not dead, it means that that's not too far. I keep going in each and every single direction and seeing how far one can go. 
so that one kid who's watching me can say, I, I can go even further because, you know, the OG Nota was able to get this far. So bringing it back to, you know, where we started with this conversation about how, you know, the media hegemony, the Afrikaans media hegemony, SABC had divided us and, and had failed. We need to understand that apartheid failed. That's why it came apart. It's not because um, uh, 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 we fought a better fight than them. No, 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 no. Their idea imploded on itself. It didn't work. It wouldn't work. And that's why they had to bring Mandela out of jail and start negotiating with him. Because this idea that they thought they could keep this power and this control with their falsified ideas by dividing us, by using this apartheid system, they thought it would work for them. And then it was bringing them under. And they were going to face um, um, uh, the judgment of many, many generations, unborn generations of Afrikaners who said, you created our slaughter. We're being massacred in the millions right now. We've been exterminated. There's not even one single white Afrikaner left in South Africa because our forefathers made the majority of the people hate us so much that we don't even have any humanity left in us. They don't see us as human. They see us as the evil that we are. You know? So, with that knowledge, with the knowledge of like, okay, so they've created a system which then uses us as slave labor in this country. All of us are slaves to this system. South Africa, as it is, South Africa incorporated as when they announce, oh, the GDP has gone up. That GDP, right, is a number of the economic output of this nation within these borders this is the economic output and which role do you play within that economic output are you one of the owners of the factors of production are you one of the owners of the means are you one of the owners of the capital or are you the labor and if you are the labor are you being paid a living wage enough that now you can invest because if you're not being paid enough to be able to invest you are being underpaid and therefore, you're a slave labor. Because if I pay you 100 rand for a day's work, but it costs you 70 rand to get here, I'm to back, and then you, you've got less than 30 rand left to eat for the day. Basically, you are being paid enough so that you can stay employed. You're not being paid a living wage. And if you're not being paid a living wage, you are a slave. If we d check what the definition of a slave is, is someone who's not being paid a living wage. And basically, we are slaves in this country. All of us are slaves. And now we've been divided by our national lines because we didn't have national identities in the, in the past. The national identities came after the Cold War, the 60s and everything else, where countries became independent and the spheres of influence then influenced us to be either a capitalist country and then we got America's support or to become a communist country, then we've got Russia's support. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, all the countries that they supported could not get that support anymore. And all the, the countries that opposed them, right, were being supported by America. But now, because America didn't have communist competition, you know what I mean? It's like, Icheri. Mwanga mfun, na mwanga mfun. I got it. Mfunu chero funwa. That gives a value. So, if I'm a country like Libya, and the country that's supporting me, Russia, does not support me anymore, I can't go to America and say, hey, that one is not interested in me, are you interested? Because the way in which it works, America is only interested in me because they've got a rival who's also interested in me. And because of the, the minerals that you have. It's, it's, the, the oil that you have, that's the thing, is that it's not even just minerals. Because at first it was about minerals and gold. Yeah. And then oil became the thing because that is the fuel for the industrial machine. You understand? So now we're seeing all these wars over oil. All these wars over control over oil. Uh, we're on the brink of a of a of a, of a no, no, nuclear no. war. No, I don't no. even think we're aware. We are already no. We are already in World War Three. <laughs> yeah, we're already in World War Three. And what they don't understand is that World War Three started on the ninth month, the eleventh day of 
2001. When Osama bin Laden made America bleed by sending airplanes to take down the World Trade Center towers. Yeah, but is that true? That was just propaganda. It, it's true. He did it. Are you sure? I'm, I'm very sure. And let me tell you why. Because hey, conspiracy theorists have turned out to be true with a lot of the things no, they've no, been saying no. over the years. No, no, no. <laughs> Look, I, we need conspiracy theories because they help um, stories have uh, fervor and more legend. And, but and they make people to have objective thinking. You can't just take everything you get told. That's the thing. That's the thing. Exactly. So, But let's look at the evidence. Right? Osama bin Laden's family are a very rich family. They are part of the kingdom. They're related to the Saudi Arab family that is in power over there. What happens is that they are faith opponents, religious opponents with certain sects of the, the Shiites and the Sunnis, Muslims, right? Those are two different religious sects, but within the same religion. It's like the Catholics and the Protestants. They're both Christians, but they're having a war. The same way the Protestants had a war and then left America because they were having a war. I mean, left Britain, right? Because they were having a war. The Irish were fighting with the English. That was a war, the Protestants versus the Catholics. That war continued so much that it even spilled over into another country. That wasn't a country at that point in time. But they said, okay, we're leaving our fatherland, our motherland, our home country. And we're going to occupy these new lands. And in this new land, we'll build our Protestant country and they did it uh, the united states of america is that protestant country that they were trying to build um so they were able to have that war and finish it and settle it amongst themselves to get to a point where it's like okay guys doesn't matter whether you're catholic doesn't matter whether you're protestant anymore we can all work together and everything else and they stopped that process from happening anywhere else in the world because they wanted the world to move on didn't matter if you guys are still having the battle that we were having a hundred years ago you're having it now and you need to settle it somewhere. And then they use that to divide the Islamic countries so that they wouldn't all be united like the Ottoman Empire imagined them to be. And they divided the Sunnis and the Shiites and then they, there was war against them. First, the, one of their soldiers, one of their CIA agents who was trained by them, Saddam Hussein, bombed Iran. Who are, they're all Muslim, but they've got a, di a different um, uh, belief system. And then there was a war there. And who was um, Saddam Hussein getting his weapons from? His training from? From the United States of America. They say he used those same weapons to invade um, um, Kuwait. And then George Bush, George Bush's father, George Bush, <laughs> and as then, like the, the way that these guys are in so much power, I can be the president. And then eight years later, my son is president. Imagine. <laughs> eight years, not a hundred years later. Eight years later, two terms of, of Bill Clinton later, my son replaces me to continue my job that I didn't finish because I only served one term. So, so when, when these guys then start interfering in that battle because now the Soviet Union is weak, it's, it's gone, it's disintegrated. I mean, it, sh it started showing its weakness when they had to move out of Afghanistan at the beginning, when they moved out of Afghanistan. The, the system collapsed because it didn't work because of the corruption. There was too much corruption and there wasn't enough of the division of the wealth. But at the end of the day, there's no such thing as a capitalist country in the world. America is not capitalist. Why you say so? America is not capitalist. It is. It's not. Why you say so? How did, um, who is Elon Musk's customer? At SpaceX, his only customer. It's the government. Who is um, um, Amazon's uh, biggest customer? Amazon, web services. It's it's the people of the world. No, it's not. It's the FBI, the CIA, the NSA. That's their biggest customer. So yes, we can put our data on Amazon Web Services, but the only reason we can put it up there is because the FBI, the CIA has full access to it and can control all that data. But I guess that's the same reason why they didn't want TikTok in America in the beginning, right? 
and Huawei, is it Huawei? No. Even Huawei, because it, they don't want the no, it's Chinese, Byte Dance. It's Byte Chinese Dance. social media platforms in their country because also... Because they're the doing the same media, thing. They're doing the same thing. Because yeah. they're doing the same thing. So we don't want it done to us. We want to do it to everybody else because we are the moral um, authority over everybody. But we can't have the same thing done to us. We can't stand the risk of these Chinese people doing what we've been doing to everybody for forever. See? So the hegemony itself tells people this lie. We're a utopia. You've got freedom of speech here. And yes, you do. You've got the right to do whatever you want. But there's limits. And just because our limits are here and the Soviet Union limits are there and more repressive, we look better. But that doesn't mean we're different. Because just like Russia is run by the oligarchs, who are the oligarchs that um, chased Donald Trump off of Twitter? It's the deep state. No, it's Jack Dorsey. It's the deep state. Yeah, but I'm just saying, Jack Dorsey is an oligarch. He's the guy who runs Twitter, and then therefore he can shut down the president. You are the president, Donald Trump, of the United States of America, the most powerful country in the world, and I can shut you down. So the deep state is what they would call the shadow government of the U.S., just like how other people in South Africa they talk about the Stellenbosch mafia, the shadow government. Yeah, <laughs> you understand? <laughs> but that's it. It's the, Afri- other it's, it's the Afrikaans it. oligarchy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the Afrikaans oligarchy, how do they protect themselves? They put black leaders there to represent their interests. Not to represent them, to represent their interests. And therefore, we look at these black leaders and we think that they're in power. They're not. Somebody said yesterday, um, the ANC is there just to manage white people rich or the oligarchs yes, interests the africans oligarchy that's it and and then I, and then when i argued when i argued the point back they said to me no it's it, it's been like that from the beginning i'm like you gotta be kidding me i think it was in Tantalak, so if mm. it was not uh penuel penuel uh, mm. the other day he was saying no from the beginning mm. because all these great educated black people who formed the anc which was an amazing movement they were amazing black people they were, were very educated well spoken. By, they were educated by the universities. They found a way to represent the masses, but they found a way to then negotiate with these ones. And how it ended up, it ended up them having to uh, be, but, but in, they ended up having to form this organization that on the other side, you've got the masses thinking it's, it's their organization, which it is. Mm. But on the other side, it was also the type of deals that were done, were done so as to protect their interests, the oligarchs. But anyways... I think we can, go, we can go on the whole day, guys. No, no. I mean, but, but you know what? Today's episode was supposed to have been a continuation of the previous one. I'm glad that we went politics. And, and mm. just wrapping it up from where we started it, for me, I can summarize it by saying programming. Radio programming is where we started this conversation. Right now, radio has evolved into podcasting, multimedia. Mm. Programming. When you're seeing this Kenya product placement all the time, or you follow me on social media all the time, you see more fire, more fire, more fire all the time. Programming, radio programming, TV programming, music programming, programming. And what Nota was saying is that earlier on, the enemy used radio as a tool to program the masses. It's social engineering. Social engineering. So what we need now, right now, what my job right now, is social re-engineering of South Africa. Decolonize the mind. That's why that's why I, I was mm. emphasizing on how do, what books do we recommend to some of our audiences out there. And I'm glad we didn't recommend a lot of books. No. We recommended you guys less than five books that I'm sure you can start on right the, now. The thing is that once you start with those books, you'll be curious. And then you're going to just keep on digging deeper. <laughs> you'll go down the rabbit hole. You'll never hole. stop. And it'll change your life. And those books are all on YouTube. Yeah. By the way, if you're lazy to read, I've already read for you, I write what I like. Just type on YouTube, just type DJ Smoo or St- DJ Smoo, Steve Biko, I write what I like. I'm reading it for you. Just press play, open the volume, do whatever you're doing in the house and listen. You understand? So now when you take that book, right? And now you take it and you say, okay, fine, I read it for you. And then after reading it for you, I summarize it for you. And I give you the concepts. Now I start making content on I write what I like. It's your reflection. It's a whole different podcast. It's a whole different podcast series. And we can do that about M. Zinwez and Caesar. We can do that about all of the shows that we grew up watching and loving and everything else because we all watch them. We all watch the reruns. We all get excited when there's reruns. We can repurpose that content so that even though Kwaskhat Deba's job was to brainwash us 
right? His actual purpose was to teach us self-love. And even though his masters, the big social engineers of the apartheid machinery, tried to use him as a tool to divide us further, we can make sure that his legacy is what unites us. That's the power that we have with all these platforms. And you watching right now can contribute to that. Nothing is stopping you. Everybody asks, hey, but Nota, what gives you the right? Nothing. I take the responsibility. You watching, take the responsibility. Take the responsibility because we all need to contribute to building this nation. That is together, whether we're Pedi, Tswana, Zulu, Africana, you name it. You know, we need to make sure that when colored people say, we don't want to be called colored, we are black, we are Africans. We understand and respect that. And when white people say, we are Afrikaners, we tell them that that language that you speak, this Afrikaans language that you speak, it's not Dutch, it's not French, it's not English. It is Afrikaans. It's a language that you started speaking so that you could communicate with the black workers that you worked with on your farms. It's a language they invented. Just in the same way they invented Isfanagalo. Afrikaans is the farmer's Isfanagalo. Because it was the Isfanagalo that allowed the farmer and the farm worker to communicate. Whether the uh, farm, farmer is from France, whether he's from Holland, they can communicate using this Afrikaans language. And had it not been for black people needing to communicate with the owners of the farms, this language wouldn't have been invented. Had it not been for black people, Afrikaans would not exist. So white people cannot take Afrikanerdom and equate it with white supremacy. Because by them just speaking this language, which was created so that they can communicate with black people, they have shown that whites are not supreme. Whites are not superior. Because whites had to change their own language so they can communicate and work together with the Africans that occupied the lands that they wanted to work. And therefore, I want us to also help people. Just like, you know, in the same way, like just help people understand the importance of what we are doing right now, the importance of, of, of what we've been doing. By creating all this culture and this art, we need to make sure that we celebrate what we've achieved ourselves so that we can teach the younger ones to celebrate it and learn from it because they value it. Because if we don't celebrate it ourselves, they won't value it. That's the reason why we need to celebrate Uzola while he's alive. Why? We're celebrating him so that we can teach the younger generation about STC to celebrate him. Abon STC are lost right now. He came up into the game, he got all to the highest heights, and then he's now back at ground level, performing at nightclubs and whatnot. We shouldn't see that as a failure. We should take a lesson in that. It's because if you deny your identity, you'll be left with nothing. Blackie has now come in. He's now the new kid that everybody's, hey, Blackie, 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 Blackie. It's as if Nasty C didn't exist. But there would not be a Blackie without the success of Nasty C. If Nasty C was not successful in what he was doing, Blackie wouldn't have had proof of concept. So we cannot create a situation where Blackie will now, two years from now, look at Nasty C and say, ah, you are lame. Because that's what we did with Zola. And then look what happened after that. Then the kids that came after that did not see him as someone they could look up to. And now we don't have someone that we can look up to that can actually teach these kids to carry on the traditions that we have and actually get us to a better future because we're on a mission as a people. You know what I mean? It, it's not something I can do within my lifetime. It's something I need to sacrifice my life for. I know that in the 70 to 100 years that I'll be alive, you know, I need to make sure that I use those 70 to 100 years, well, 70 years where I'm actually functional with my mind. And then from there, from, from 70 onwards to 100, you know what I mean? 
let me do whatever I, no I want to do. <laughs> authority. Let, let me do what, whatever I want to do. Let me get to 100 and, and while out. You know, it'll be your turn to do, to do what you're doing. But if we don't create that, then we lose so much. The, there's, a, there's a podcast I went to, ne? and I said to them, when DJ Spoo went like this on the Metro FM Awards stage, He had no idea what he was doing. But because you did that and you got fired for doing that, right? Because you didn't understand that this platform that you're doing that on was designed by the Afri- apartheid government. You think how Mvana says cousin, says it's black. No. No, Spusiso. You are black. SABC was made by the National Party, the apartheid master. So when I, if you think that you can promote this black-owned brand on our platform, we will show you who you are. You work for us. That's who you are. You are fired. We don't care how many uh, listeners you bring in. We don't care how much advertising revenue you bring in. We don't care that you're the best thing to happen to Metro FM. We don't care. We will humble you publicly. We'll show everyone that looks up to you that we're in a... 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 That's how we'll reduce you. We'll leave you lying on the floor in blood the same way we did to Chris Hani. So that we teach anyone that ever thinks that they can do what you did that they can't do what they did. And what happened? They failed. Because a couple years later, who went up onto the stage? Ricky Rick. And what did he do? He opened up an entire can of worms. He said, DJ Spoo came onto this stage and they killed him on radio. So he went to live on the internet. I'm on this stage because DJ Spoo went to the internet. And then I followed him to the internet. Anybody else who wants to get here or get further than me, the internet is your friend. And then how many generations of artists owe their success to DJ Spoo who opened up this can so that Ricky Rick can make that speech and free our minds. They thought they were killing you, but they made you a martyr. And that's the reason why we have to raise you up. And I use that example very close because you're not the only person who had that opportunity. DJ Fresh had the very same opportunity. And I'm not trying to diss DJ Fresh, but I'm just saying, if you look at what has happened in his career, compared to what happened to you. Because when that happened to you, DJ Fresh didn't come out and say, there's no way you're firing Spoo. If you fire Spoo, I'm quitting my job on 5FM. When that happened to you, none of the other SABC DJs said, you know what? You fire Spoo, you fire us all. You, management, you'll come and, 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 and work these discs yourselves. That's, that, that is what we lost in that. You know what I mean? So your success is proof that you can age gracefully in this industry. We don't see 45-year-olds aging gracefully, 50-year-olds aging gracefully. We didn't even get to see Miriam Makeba aging gracefully because in her last days, she was still gigging to pay her bills, to pay her bond. She died on stage as a legend. She freed us from apartheid and then had to die on stage while working because she couldn't free herself. She couldn't get the financial freedom that could allow her to retire with dignity after that ultimate sacrifice. Imagine that our, our legend, Mira Makeba had to die while on stage. And like, yes, we've come full circle. Like now we bring it back to, to that whole entire thing. Of course, did what he could, the limitations. He had many limitations, you know, to allow black people to actually find a voice for themselves within this apartheid uh, machinery. Now we have defeated apartheid because it, it's self-destructed. Now we cannot defeat ourselves and betray our mission. You know what I mean? We, we can't betray our mission as, uh, as this youthful generation. We can't betray our mission. My generation, uh, my job in my generation is to celebrate your generation. So that the generation that is watching me can celebrate us. And the generation that is watching them can celebrate them. And then it continues like that. And then instead of having generational poverty, we have generational wealth. 
we keep the wealth, the knowledge amongst ourselves, we pass it on. And then when we die, and when we are buried in 70 years from now, when the world is ending anyway, you know what I mean? When we die, we can at least then know that that tombstone is not sitting there lightly. A, a lot of heavy work has gone into making sure that that tombstone is sitting on something significant. It's not just a tombstone that's sitting on soil. What is underneath the soil is worth more than what's on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> the previous episode, but why uh, you not my one hour long? Because I'm a good listener and I love learning. So, uh, as I said earlier, not, nothing we say here is gospel truth. You can disagree with us all mm. you want. It's a good thing that we are all engaging on this internet thing, guys. We're growing something here. Uh, this podcast phenomenon is a beautiful thing that I'm seeing emerge on the internet. And I'd like to appreciate Nota. I'd like to appreciate his time. This is not the last time he's coming back. By the way, we never finished his story on the previous interview. While he was still telling me his story, we got cut off by the rain. And we thought we'll continue today. But today we ended up going off of a tangent and it became another beautiful episode of its own. So we want Nota back. <laughs> We have to finish your story, bro. Like, we, you remember, we never spoke about the music we, industry. We, 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 we never spoke about the story. We I never think, speak about the music industry. Think, we'll do I, the next episode. I think what I want to leave it here is this. Is that, you know, after everything that we've spoken about and everything else, and like with in mind, okay, everyone's going to be like, ah, no, we wait for your story now. Before you have my story, just understand that for me, I'm heartbroken because I'm seeing my generation betraying its purpose. And... I'm doing everything I can to ensure that I'm waking up as many people to that fact that we could be betraying our purpose. I, I, I had many, 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 many intimate, deep, long conversations with um, my brother Ricardo Macad. To the kids that looked up to him, just understand that even when you look up to us, right? The stuff that we're doing here is to inspire you. But at the same time, it takes so much from us. My brother died a very tormented man because everyone around him wanted something from him. When someone sees DJ Smuda, everyone around Ricky, everyone around Ricky wanted something from him. And sometimes the people that are around you because of like your blood, your relatives, your family, for them, They've got no choice. They're around you because of that. But when they benefit from you, they don't understand what that does to you. Because now you see yourself as hanging on a rope, as a sacrificial lamb that needs to keep everybody afloat. You know what I mean? On, on, uh, um, it, you know what I mean? Sometimes I want to put the ball down. That's what Ricky says. I want to put the ball down. But if you do it, Ricky, then we're all down. If you do it, Ricky, we all suffer. Ricky put the ball down. Now we're all down. Now we're all suffering. It's up to us, the generation that was inspired by him, his peers, to pick the ball back up. Because we know what happens when we put the ball down. Thank you very much for this conversation. Rest in peace to me, Moy, DJ Dimples. Thank rest in so peace, much, man. Rest in peace. Rest in peace to, to him as well. You know what I mean? Rest in peace. Um, pop bottles. You know, he put, he picked the ball up. Yeah. You know, and um, his legacy will live on if us who are inspired by him and moved by him keep it alive. We need to keep his legacy alive. People have seen the power of keeping someone's legacy alive. You've seen this week how everyone has been coming in to celebrate Zola. Let it not be something that is done for clout chasing. Ask Natati Tom Benje, just so that I can show people that, oh, no Zola. You understand what I'm saying? Let's actually make sure that we're keeping the legacy alive. Let's support the music and everything else. You know what I mean? Because you showed me that example when you said, okay, fine, all these other media platforms and everything have cancelled Zola. Mina, I'm, I'll un uncancel him. I'm taking it upon myself. And then all of a sudden, he got a TV show, Utatako, whatever. The other media started to uncancel him. Because you set that off as a brother and said, this is how we treat our own brothers. You've set the example. You've been a role model to us. And I don't want you to, to feel like you're doing it for nothing. 
because seeing me dressed in more fire by the way that was a beautiful coincidence it's not even a beautiful <laughs> coincidence no it's not a coincidence i'm inspired by the founder of more fire he's my hero i need to wear it so that people see that that is my hero because one day it'll be a kid who will be wearing whatever brand i decide to design one day you know what i mean and then they will show other kids that actually we can look up to our black brothers and see them as heroes you know because there's no mother that's out there that can tell their child ai ungamlale lusibuda uistawa ui drug addict or whatever that's taken a lot of discipline from you amongst all the temptations and everything else for you to stay on the right path knowing that there's a mother that's raising their kid that needs me to stay on the right path so that she can use me as an example because there isn't that role model they've taken the black father out of the household whether it be physically whether it be emotionally whether it be spiritually whether it be mentally the black father in black communities has got no authority over his own home when we find a black father who's got authority over his home it's an exception because as a black man you've got no authority over your own life because the africans oligarchy control everything they control what you eat they control where you work they control how much you earn they can control how much you aspire to you understand and that's the that's what they've done to the black man but everything you look at that is beautiful in this country everything everything that you praise south africa on was built by black men ladies and gentlemen nota follow him on social media by the way i'd like to give a big shout out to where we are recording we are in rosebank at clico boutique hotel check them out we'll put the link in the description um check out their website it's clico.co.za nota thank you bro i appreciate you thanks and then yeah <laughs> let me know <laughs> let me know when you got the sugar free mo fire oh yeah yeah, yeah. Hade, hade. Sugar. <laughs> it's coming. Sure. but this one is high in caffeine aye, at least <laughs> guys thank you for the support we'll see you guys on the next episode if you haven't subscribed yet please do so share the video and we'll see you on the next episode. I love you guys. This is The Hustlers Corner.